Hello folks and welcome to Control Theory in Practice. I hope that you are just doing great. What is happening here today? Well, after having explained uh, uh, what is control theory and why it can boost uh, your organization productivity, today I will try to explain how control theory actually works. Let's start. Control theory provides you with awesome methods and very powerful tools that combine all together shape a well-defined way of working. For instance, the three pillars of control theory, namely the goal, the available information, and the decision making that we discussed in a previous video, are mapped into each phase of this process. But now, given that explanation of each single phase of this process will just take forever, today I will only give you a short overview, while I will provide you with more details in some dedicated videos. So, stay tuned, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell icon to know when a new video is released. And let's start with the first phase. This part is connected to the goal and available information pillars, and it originates from a very simple question, which is How can you play a game if you don't know the rules? In other words, how can you take good decisions when you are operating in a given context if you have no clue what you are allowed to do, you don't know the effect of taking action A instead of action B, and things like that. In other words, how can you drive a car if you don't know the effect when you push this pedal instead of the other, or what happens when you manipulate this strange lever? For this reason, at the very beginning, control theory requires you to pull the handbrake and focus only on understanding the context where you are operating. In other words, you should focus on the what, leaving the how only for later on. I know that's easy said, but we all have the tendencies in jumping in designing a solution without understanding the problem, sometimes. In the previous example, this means that you just have to understand what is the purpose of these pedals and this strange lever without bothering how to operate them. To facilitate you with the system analysis task, you can use a checklist where you have some questions that, from a control theory perspective, are always the same, no matter if you are dealing with a power plant or if you are working on bioengineering. In addition to that, control theory provides you other methods that are called the four horsemen, but I will discuss them in another video. Finally, during this phase, you should also try to formalize a sharp control goal, which is somehow on the same wavelength of uh, uh, the SMART requirements. Have you ever heard about the SMART requirements? Do you know what the SMART stands for? Okay, I will tell you anyway. SMART stands for Specific, Measurable, Achievable, Realistic, and Time-Bounded. And guess what? Control Theory provides you with an incredibly powerful tool for helping you in defining goals, and that all of you heard about. Wanna guess what is this tool? Should I tell you? Okay, this tool is Mathematics. But don't be scared, you don't need to be a number cruncher for dealing with this. All you have to do is to use mathematics in a creative way for expressing goals. That's all. For example, if my goal is to... Did it work? Well, apparently, if my goal is to keep this room temperature at a constant temperature of, say, 20 degrees, no matter if the window is open or closed or how many people are sitting inside, then I can write something like this. This reads, the room temperature should converge to 20 degrees and stay there, no matter the window position and how many people are sitting in the room. I promise you that if you formalize the goal in this way, then eventually bugs in your requirement will immediately pop up and you can fix them already at this stage. Isn't it cool? This is part of the available information pillar and it addresses the problem of how to get accurate real-time information for taking decisions. Now, for real-time information, I don't mean only the information that I'm picking in this exact time instant, but it can also include information from the past and from the future. But let's clarify that through an example. Let's analyze again the temperature of this room. 
Imagine that it is 3.30 and that the room temperature is 20 degrees. Also imagine that we know that uh, average temperature between uh, 1.30 and 3.30, so in the last uh, two hours, was, uh, I don't know, 18.5 degrees and that the temperature uh, in uh, two hours should be 24 degrees according to some more or less accurate uh, forecast. In spite I use past and present information, note that the global information still contain three elements which are these and that this information change with time. For example, if we stop the time at 4.30, we can see that this information has changed. I hope that the example was clear. Anyway, control theory requires you to focus on how to measure only the relevant information that has a clear connection to the goal. You can safely rule out all the unnecessary things because they just create a mess. For example, if you are designing the braking system of a vehicle, you should focus only on how to measure the vehicle speed, the road friction and things like that. But don't bother on how to measure the cab temperature because this is not important for this goal. I mean, the cab temperature is important for our comfort, but not for this specific goal. Therefore, the problem on how to measure it should be ruled out. Period. Now I imagine that someone is wondering, but does control theory provide us with some methods and tools for getting real-time information? And the answer is yes. Have you ever heard about filters, uh, sampling methods, Fourier transforms, observers and things like that? So these methods and tools serve exactly for this purpose. But again, even during this phase, please pull the handbrake and focus only on how to get meaningful real-time information. Don't bother how to use it, that will come later on. I understand that you are trembling because you want to jump into designing a solution and showing off how cool you are, but believe me, Patience is the virtue of the winners. This phase is perhaps the most important part of all the control theory way of working. You often hear control theory people saying, oh, you know what, if you have a model, you have everything. And I do absolutely agree with them. But what is a model? Well, a model essentially is a small scale representation of a reality. It could be, for example, the project of a house, a drawing of a cloth, or a geographical map. But why we use models? Well, we use models because they make our life easier. Like, for example, can you imagine to start building a house without any project or driving in a foreign country without any map? Of course you can do that, but why? There is also a super cool thing here. If you think a little bit out of the box, you can consider a model as a tool for predicting the future. For example, a drawing of a plot tells us how the plot will look like once it will be realized. Or a geographical map tells us that if we drive toward the south starting from Los Angeles, then at some point in the future we will reach San Diego. Nice, huh? How to get a model? Well, as said, a model is a small-scale representation of a reality. Nevertheless, like a picture, if you reduce the size, you also reduce the details. Now, the process of reducing a reality and casting it into a model is called abstraction. More precisely, to abstract means to keep only the relevant information for your goal, ruling out everything which is not necessary. For example, again, if I'm studying the braking system of a vehicle, what is the purpose of getting crazy modeling the effect of the vehicle color to the braking system? But what if instead I'm studying the climate control? Then in that case the vehicle color affects the climate control and therefore it makes sense to spend time in modeling it. What kind of models are used in control? Well, in control theory, almost all the time we have to deal with quantities that change over time like for example temperatures, uh, concentrations, uh, stock values and so on. And therefore we need a modeling tool for capture this type of behavior. And guess what? Control theory provides you with an excellent tool for modeling this type of systems. This tool is again mathematics. 
More precisely, control theory used by large differential equations, difference equations, or a mixture of both because they can model this type of behavior in an extremely elegant and compact way. Finally, we arrive in designing our solution. Now, if you have formalized your goal, if you have good real-time information, and if you have a good model, you are ready for designing your decision-making strategy. And control theory suggests you an excellent approach for doing that. Don't. Yes, you hear it right. No misunderstanding. You don't have to develop any solution. In fact, control theory provides you with uh, a number of methods and tools that you can use right off the shelf, depending on what is your goal, what available information do you have, and uh, how your model looks like. These techniques include standard methods like feedback and feedforward that you can apply everywhere, plus others that are more specific to engineering, like uh, PID control, LQ control, and so on. In addition to that, you have a huge literature where you can find a lot of solutions for many problems and for many application domains. Obviously, sometimes you need to cook your own recipe, but believe me, the control theory literature is huge and most likely you will always find what you need. So the problem here becomes, are you able to read and understand a control theory paper and to take that solution and implement it and test it? So my suggestion is, don't try to reinvent the wheel, but instead stand on the giant's shoulders because you are taller and you can reach higher heights. When you are testing, you have to do three things. The first one is to identify a comparison baseline. The second is to define meaningful metrics that can be possibly translated into numbers. And the third is to compare your solution with the baseline. The baseline is important because it secures that you are not comparing apples with oranges and the metrics are important because it allows you to perform a uh, fair comparison. For example, if you have to compare oranges and we take the weight as metric, then we can say that orange A is greater than orange B if orange A weights more than orange B. But if we take dimension as a comparison metric, then it will be the other way around. Sometimes you have many metrics that spread the information around and the comparison may be a bit cumbersome. Then in that case, a good idea would be to lump all together some of these metrics and define new comparison metrics. In our example, we could define a metric, uh, let's call it Fu, in this way, and we can use this metric to compare oranges. In this case, this is the result. Finally, talking about the metrics, guess what I'm going to tell you right now? Well, control theory provides you with metrics that can evaluate how good is your decision-making strategy. These metrics can tell you, for example, uh, how well you will reach your goal, uh, how much you depart from it, uh, how does it take before you reach it, and things like that. An interesting thing is that bank metrics, they give you numbers, and therefore at the end there is little room for discussing which solution is better. Finally, it's worth mentioning that you can evaluate these metrics at different levels, like from virtual environments to laboratory and to the actual deployment field. I hope that now it is more clear how control theory works. I understand that I may have missed uh, some important part, but pretty much what I showed you is uh, how control theory actually works. An interesting thing with this way of working is that uh, control theory does not tell you only, okay, you should work in this way, but for each phase provide you methods and tools so you can get the best out of it. Also, please don't consider this process as a waterfall method because it is not. In fact, some part can even be run in parallel and also the output of some phase can be used as an input on another phase and that all the process grow up all together. Although this way of working is extremely powerful and to some extent even a bit obvious, but in my experience, and not only my experience, the way of approaching problems in this way is a source of countless conflicts. And there are at least two reasons for that. One is connected to people's competencies and the other one to organization culture. 
The first one is that control theory methods often come from a lateral thinking approach, while human tend to follow a vertical thinking approach. Now, the difference is that uh, vertical thinking approach follows a logical step-by-step -step approach for finding solution, and it represents the most natural human approach for solving problems, while lateral thinking generates reasoning which is not obvious and straightforward and may be difficult to be accepted. The most typical example of uh, lateral thinking is the Solomon judgment. Have you ever heard about that? Okay, I will tell you anyway because this is an interesting story. So, at some point, King Solomon had to solve a um, controversy between two mothers that were claiming the parentage of a child. King Solomon proposed a very simple idea. Let's cut the child into two parts. By doing that, he was able to discern the new mother as the one who entirely approved with this decision and the real mother as the one begging to not use this word and accepting to leave the entire child to the other mother. Obviously, this solution could be implemented because King Solomon was the king and therefore he had full decisional power over anyone else. But can you imagine if, instead of the king, you have to find the solution to the same problem by common agreement with a bunch of other people and you come up with the same solution of the king? I am pretty sure that they, they would not even let you to finish speaking and perhaps you will be banned by any other further discussion. So, one reason for getting into conflicts is because people may not be familiar with the lateral thinking and they may push back your ideas. But this I see that just as a competencies issue. The other one is related to organization culture. Let's make an example. In many software development workplaces, it often happens that if you don't start coding from day one once you get a task assigned, even if it's not clear what, what is the task is all about, but instead you propose to clarify the goal or to make a system model and things like that, then most likely people will believe that you are just finding excuses to not make your job and you are just wasting time. Or maybe it is just your boss who likes to show off and he likes to throw fireworks every day. With fireworks I mean throwing big claims about exceptional achievement even if it's far from being true and therefore you are requested to deliver something every day. I mean, sometimes it seems that throwing something on the table and then start patching it for days, weeks, years, only for having something that barely works right now but will surely create huge problems in the future, is the only viable way. And if you propose something different, then you end up in conflicts. But this is of course organization culture problem and thankfully not all the organizations are the same. Anyway, let's go back to talk about control theory, which is safer. I often mention that control theory is strongly based on mathematics, and there is a reason for that. It's simply because mathematics work. The game is easy. Mathematicians fill a toolbox, and the control theory guys use the tools from that toolbox. Obviously, you can choose another toolbox for solving your problems, but watch out, because if mathematics is telling you that 1 plus 1 is 2, and you just neglect that hiding your head under the sand, pretending not to see and not to hear, well, keep in mind that at the end things may not really work as expected. I mean, keep in mind that very often the success of the failure depends on how you use a certain tool, and not on the tool itself. I can also mention that despite a natural adversity toward mathematics, in my little experience, if you take it from an application side, it generates a genuine interest. And for this, I want to share a couple of anecdotes of my life. I remember one of my former colleagues that after he solved an engineering problem in a very elegant way, he stared at me and then he said, I would never ever imagine in my entire life that one day I could use differential equations for solving a real world problem. Or another one that told me, oh, you know what, this thing of Fourier is just amazing, I never get it right at school. I can tell you that uh, they go to work now more relaxed, they feel more engaged and passionate and can attack problems from a different perspective and this led them to being able to solve problems and they are becoming fairly requested engineers, I must say. Okay, sorry for sharing this story, but I think that those are the biggest satisfactions.
We arrive at the end of this video. I hope that you enjoyed it and if so, please consider to subscribe to the channel. And what else? Thank you for watching and see you next time.